the nightly business report. Good evening. Tonight, the International Monetary Fund meets Ceylon Chamber of Commerce and dwell into various aspects of the country's taxation framework. A parliamentary committee discussed setting up an agency to regulate the transport of goods and services on Sri Lanka's inland waterways. The stock market showed promise with mixed indices yesterday, but today it dips into negative territory with both indices closing in the red. Elon Musk announces relocating the headquarters of two more of his companies from California to Texas. From Studio 24, here's Sanuvi Mudanayaka. Good evening and thank you for joining us. The Ceylon Chamber of Commerce has reported that a delegation from the International Monetary Fund headed by Peter Mullins recently engaged in discussions with officials of the Chamber regarding Sri Lanka's tax system. This meeting, which took place recently, aimed to dwell into various aspects of the country's taxation framework, exploring potential reforms and improvements. The dialogue underscored mutual interests in enhancing fiscal policies to foster economic stability and sustainable growth amid current challenges faced by Sri Lanka's economy. The IMF team, which is in Colombo for a technical assistance mission on tax policy, met with chamber officials to discuss the Sri Lankan tax system, including challenges and concerns, particularly regarding tax expenditures, exemptions and incentives, the CCC said in a statement. Chamber Chairman Duminda Hulangamwa, Deputy Vice Chairman Bingumal Tivatantri, Senior Economist Sanjay Aryawansa and Chamber Tax and Investment Promotion Steering Committees attended the meeting. The IMF bailout plan for the island nation has recommended that Sri Lanka must continue to raise taxes to achieve a budget surplus. A parliamentary committee have discussed setting up an agency to regulate the transport of goods and services on Sri Lanka's inland waterways. The Secretarial Oversight Committee on Energy and Transport met in Parliament recently. A parliament statement said that since Sri Lanka is an island, transportation by waterways can be encouraged as a remedy to reduce traffic congestion during the period when office services start in the morning around the city of Colombo. Although there had been discussions on how to carry out transportation through waterways for a long time, no formal system had been prepared. The statement did not say whether any attempts were made to find out whether existing state agencies could handle the task. The committee, chaired by Nalika Bandar Kotegoda, discussed the non-operation of the advanced water transportation system that existed in the country before the colonial era and pointed out that it is important to prepare a suitable system for this purpose. The committee instructed officials that it is important to establish an institution to regulate the transport of goods and services through inland waterways and to take necessary steps for that purpose. Officials were to inform the committee regarding its progress within a month. Water Supply Minister Jeevan Thonderman says Sri Lanka will see a definite reduction in water tariff, possibly towards end of this week after several variables in the water pricing formula, including electricity costs, have fallen. Sri Lanka's Public Utilities Commission cut electricity tariffs by an average of 22.5%. The move comes ahead of a presidential poll between the 17th of September and the 16th of October. Thonderman said the water tariff will come down because electricity is one of the key components in the water pricing. So um, let me first start off by commending Honourable Minister Kanchana Vijay Sekhar under the leadership of the President His Excellency Ronald Vikramasinghe who has managed to reduce the electricity tariffs. And in turn, that has set off a domino effect where, as all of you are aware, the water sector is a dependent industry. The water sector is dependent on various other factors. And we had made a promise earlier that should the electricity tariffs come down, so will the water tariffs. And right now, my team is uh, studying the variables, not just on reducing water tariffs based on electricity, but also reducing uh, water tariffs based on the interest rates, which have come down from 26 to 11%. And also the dollar rate, because as many of you are aware, the chemicals that we procure for the water board are imported, and it's based on the dollar. So now since the dollar rate has also come down, uh, we are basically uh, doing a quick study. I think within this week we will know how much we'd be able to reduce the water tariff by. The flyover at Kowala Junction was officially declared open and handed over to the public. Prime Minister Dinesh Gunawardana proceeded over the inauguration ceremony, joined by Minister of Highways and Transportation, Pandana Gunawardana. 
Stretching over 297 meters with a width of 9.4 meters, the newly constructed flyover spans across a bustling four-lane road that links Nugegoda and Kalaborila, previously controlled by traffic signals. This overhead bridge not only promises to alleviate traffic congestion, but also aims to enhance commuter safety and streamline connectivity in this vital corridor of urban transportation. The opening of the flyover represents a concerted effort by the government to improve infrastructure and facilitate smoother transportation for the public, underscoring its commitment to enhancing the quality of urban life and fostering economic growth through efficient logistics and connectivity. The project, funded with a total of 35 million rupees, aims to ease congestion and enhance traffic flow along Route 120 Piliandla Road, significantly benefiting commuters in the area. Cabinet spokesman Minister Bandala Gunavardhan announced that Sri Lanka is embarking on a significant development initiative for the Charing Hill country, Nanua Railway Station, utilizing funds from the Tourism Development Authority. Gunavardhan elaborated to reporters yesterday that what began as a 74.63 million rupee modernization project has now escalated to 101.81 million rupees due to increased costs of construction materials. He further explained that financing for the project will be sourced from the Central Engineering Consultancy Bureau, completed by contributions from the Sri Lanka Tourism Development Authority and the Sri Lanka Tourism Promotion Bureau. The Nanoya Railway Station serves as a focal point for both local and international travellers exploring the scenic delights of Norelia and other hill country destinations. The initiative underscores Sri Lanka's commitment to enhancing tourism infrastructure, aiming to elevate visitor experiences and promote the region's natural beauty on a global stage. Let's go for a short break. This is the Nightly Business Report. Welcome back to the Nightly Business Report. Yesterday, the stock market showed promise with mixed indices. But today, it dipped into negative territory, with both indices closing in the red. Both the All Share Price Index and the S&P SL20 Index reached new lows by the end of today's trading session, signalling a prevailing negative sentiment in the market. For more on this, let's go to Nagusan Balachanthiran joining us from Capital Lions Securities. Yes, Sanvi. Today, the Colombo Stock Exchange concluded on a negative note compared to the previous trading sessions brought on by negative sentiments among market participants. Investors also showed signs of reluctance to participate due to volatile market conditions. The market ended at 11,830 points, marking a 48 points decrease from the previous session with a turnover of 1.2 billion rupees. With more than half of the turnover being contributed by share transfers in the form of market crossings. The SL20 index also experienced a downward movement of 15.49 points to the end of day at 3,459 points. Notable institutional engagement was observed across various sectors with crossings recorded on John Q's Holdings, Haymas Holdings and Haley's uh, PLC. The top, uh, the top five gainers for the day were Blue Diamond Jewelry, Industrial Asphalts, UV Finance, Tessagro Non-Voting and SMB Leasing. The top five losers for the day were SMB Leasing Non-Voting, uh, Amara Tuck Full Life, Standard uh, Capital PLC, the Norelia Hotels Company PLC and Samsung International PLC. Today, the central bank conducted its weekly bill auction, providing crucial updates on the outcomes and to get the insights on this, let's connect with Netmi Fernando from First Capital Holdings. Thank you. CBSL held its LKR 110 billion T bill auction on the 17th of July 2024, where the total offered amount of LKR 110 billion was accepted during today's auction. However, the auction yields experienced a decline for the second consecutive session during the day, declining over 14 basis points. Accordingly, 91-day maturities declined by 36 basis points to 9.55%, 182-day maturities declined by 32 basis points to 9.78% and 364-day maturities declined by 14 basis points 
to 10.07%. Notably, the rates decreased for the second consecutive auction mainly influenced by the weekly increase in the liquidity levels where the central bank has attained to maintain at around LKR 100 billion uh, levels for the past few weeks. In addition to that, the positivity surrounding the finalization of the much awaited external debt restructuring process which has given the market a clear direction has had an influence on the yield rates to ease. Uh, further to that, the speculations regarding the next monetary policy announcement which is scheduled for the 24th of July has also had some impact on the decline in TBL auction yield rates as the investors expect rates to decline pivoting from uh, the direction last time uh, where the central bank decided to maintain the standing deposit facility rate and the lending facility rate at 8.5% and 9.5% respectively. So next, moving on to the secondary market sentiment and impact, uh, the market displayed buying sentiment at the commencement of the week, pivoting from the lethargic movement during the previous uh, week. Uh, taking into consideration of today, prior to the auction, the short tenors, mainly 2027 and 2028 tenors, witnessed declines in rates. But further towards the day, post bill auction, the secondary market displayed not much, not significantly not much activity, awaiting for further clarity. Gold prices rose to record highs in Asia trade today, extending a strong round of recent gains amid growing optimism that Federal Reserve will cut interest rates in September. Spot prices rose 0.2% to a record high of $2,478.65 an ounce, while gold futures expiring in August hit a record high of $2,483.65 an ounce. Gains in gold were driven chiefly by increased optimism over interest rate cuts by the Federal Reserve. Soft consumer price index inflation data and dovish leading signals from the Fed saw traders widely positioning for a September rate cut. Oil prices were steady today after benchmark Brent hit a one-month low as a decline in U.S. oil stockpiles helped offset signs of weakened demand in China. Brent crude oil futures were up just 1% or 0.01% to $83.74 a barrel. U.S. West Texas Intermediate crude futures were up 10 cents or 0.12 percent at $80.86. In the United States, the world's largest oil producer and consumer, crude oil inventories fell by 4.4 million barrels in the week ended July 12th. Today, the Sri Lankan rupee has seen a further decline against the U.S. dollar compared to yesterday, as reported by the Central Bank of Sri Lanka. The buying rate for the U.S. dollar has risen from 297 rupees and 73 cents to 299 rupees and 15 cents. And the selling rate has also increased from 307 rupees and 5 cents to 308 rupees and 46 cents. The rupee has also showcased a decline against some other global currencies as well. And now, let's have a look at its rates. A short commercial break now, more updates right after this. This is the Nightly Business Report. Welcome back to the Nightly Business Report. SLT Mobitel, the national ICT solutions provider and Sri Lanka's most loved ride-hailing and food delivery app Uber, have come together to offer tailor-made, value-added connectivity solutions for merchants, couriers and drivers, registered on the Uber's platform in Sri Lanka. As part of the partnership, customized connectivity solutions designed to meet the unique needs of merchants, couriers and drivers were announced in the presence of senior leaders from both companies under Uber package. 
Given the rapid use of smartphones and internet connectivity in the app-based economy, along with high data consumption, the package offered under this partnership fulfills data, calls and SMS requirements at an unbeatable price. Features of this package include 15 gigabytes of data for Uber, Google Maps and WhatsApp, along with an additional 5 gigabytes of anytime data for browsing and streaming purposes. It also offers 750 minutes of calls and 750 SMS to any network at just 597 rupees. The Uber package is designed to offer the best value for money and added convenience, ensuring registered merchants, couriers and drivers stay connected with Uber's platform effortlessly, enhancing the overall Uber experience for everyone in the value chain. To activate the Uber package, customers can dial hash 170 hash, reload the package value or use the SLT Mobitel self-care app. CFA Society Sri Lanka was pleased to announce a successful conclusion of the event titled Navigating the Future of Finance, which took place on the 16th of July at King's Court, Cinnamon Lakeside, Colombo. The event was a pivotal gathering for CFOs and senior industry leaders focusing on strategic financial management, risk assessment, decision making under uncertainty and advancing innovation in corporate companies. The agenda included deep discussions on critical financial issues and emerging trends affecting the industry. Participants engaged in interactive sessions aimed at enhancing leadership skills, fostering strategic foresight and exploring new paradigms in financial governance. Topics covered included leveraging digital transformation, sustainable finance practices and regulatory compliance amidst evolving market conditions. Anura Alvis, President of CFA Society Sri Lanka, underscored the event's significance in advancing professional development and thought leadership among CFOs and senior executives. The forum aimed to cultivate a robust community of practice where industry leaders could exchange insights, forge partnerships and collectively address challenges shaping the future of finance. Kenneth De Silva, a senior banker and an economist, joined the board of Lanka Rating Agency for this month after his three-year tenure as a chairman of Lanka Pay, a leading payments and settlements company. Lanka Rating Agency is a credit rating agency operating in Sri Lanka and licensed by the Securities and Exchange Commission of Sri Lanka. De Silva counts over 20 years of experience in banking that includes covering risk management, trade finance and investment banking businesses at HSBC and Citibank NA. He was a part of the global advisory team for Sri Lanka's initial sovereign dollar bond issuance in 2007. A recognition program for the athletics participants in the 2024 Summer Olympics in Paris, France was held recently in Mount Lavinia under the patronage of Siddhalipa Institute Chairman Ashok Hettigode. This event was organized to honor three distinguished athletes and their coaches for their dedication and achievements in their respective sports. The athletes honored were Tarushi Karuna Ratna, who will be representing Sri Lanka in the 800 meters event, Dilhani Lekamge, who will be competing in the women's javelin throw, and Anura Darshana. Their senior coach, Susanta Fernando, was also recognized for his invaluable contributions to their training and development. Chairman Ashoka Hettigoda expressed his admiration for the athletes' perseverance and their coach's guidance. During the event, he presented the athletes with financial donations to support their journey and preparations for the Olympics. Additionally, they were gifted Siddhalepa Ayurvedic products as a token of appreciation from the Institute. Furthermore, Chairman Hettigoda announced that arrangements had been made for the athletes to receive treatments at the Siddhalepa Ayurvedic Hospital. The recognition program concluded with a heartfelt appreciation from the athletes themselves, who expressed their gratitude for the support and encouragement they have received. First Capital Holdings PLC, a member of the Jan Shakti Group, was honoured with the Technology Resilient Company of the Year 2024 award in the capital markets sector at the Inaugural Digital Trust Awards 2024. This is organised by the Information Systems Audit and Control Association Sri Lanka. The company says that this recognition showcases their contribution and commitment to maintaining technological excellence, innovation and resilience in an evolving digital space. First Capital has designed its technology infrastructure with scalability at the forefront. Let's take a short commercial break. This is the Nightly Business Report.
Welcome back to the Nightly Business Report. Asian stocks were mostly low today, even as investors wagered that the Federal Reserve will come ahead with a cut to interest rates, while Australia's benchmark hit a new record. In Tokyo, the Nikkei 225 index gave up early gains to shed 0.4% to 41,097.69. Australia's S&P ASX 200 advanced 0. 0.7% to 8057.90 after hitting an all-time high of 8083.70 during morning trade. South Korea's Kospi shed 0.8% to 2843.29. Hong Kong's Hang Seng gained 0.2% to 17761.66, while the Shanghai Composite Index lost 0.3% to 2967.32. The International Monetary Fund said that world growth is at risk from elevated inflation, which requires higher interest rates, while keeping projections for 2024 at 3.2% and slightly raising the 2025 growth by 0.1% to 3.3%. The IMF said in a July update to its World Economic Output report that the risk of elevated inflation has raised the prospects of higher for even longer interest rates which in turn increases external, fiscal and financial risks. Persistently high interest rates could raise borrowing costs further and affect financial stability if fiscal improvements do not offset higher real rates amid lower potential growth. Global inflation went up after economic bureaucrats in the US, UK, Europe and many other countries printed money and states also expanded spending during coronavirus using some of the printed money. Meanwhile, the report said price increases were still happening in many countries partly due to services which were seeing lagged wage growth. However, it further said that gradual cooling of labour markets together with an expected decline in energy prices should bring headline inflation back to target by the end of 2025. Wall Street stocks rose and the Dow Jones Industrial Average hit a record closing high after US retail sales data supported the view that the Federal Reserve is approaching its easing cycle, reigning in inflation while avoiding a recession. The Dow closed at an all-time high on Tuesday after US retail sales data supported expectations the Federal Reserve will start cutting interest rates soon. The Dow gained more than 1.8%. The S&P 500 added more than six-tenths of a percent, and the Nasdaq added two-tenths. Investors continued their recent rotation out of some mega-cap tech stocks, with NVIDIA and Microsoft both ending lower. Meanwhile, small caps extended their rally. The Russell 2000 index notched its fifth straight day of gains greater than 1 percent, its longest winning streak since April 2000. Among individual movers, United Health Group jumped 6.5% after reporting profit that beat Wall Street estimates. Bank of America's second quarter profit also beat expectations, and underwriting fees rose as capital markets resurged. The second largest U.S. bank also provided upbeat net interest income guidance, sending its shares up more than 5%. Charles Schwab, however, reported a dip in net interest income. Its share slid more than 10 percent. And Tinder parent Match jumped 7.5 percent on news that activist investor Starboard has a stake of over 6.5 percent in the company. Elon Musk announced that he is relocating the headquarters of two more of his companies, social media platform X and rocket company SpaceX, from California to Texas. He cited a recent gender identity law in California as the last straw prompting the move. Elon Musk said Tuesday he will move the headquarters of social media platform X and rocket company SpaceX from California to Texas. The billionaire cited a new California gender identity law as the, quote, final straw. Musk, who has a transgender daughter, added the move was spurred by the law and the quote many others that preceded it, attacking both families and companies. With these steps, the world's richest man will have relocated Tesla and most of his companies to Texas. He changed his own residence in 2021 from California to Texas, where there is no state income tax on individuals. Musk last week endorsed Republican Donald Trump for president. Wedbush Securities Managing Director Dan Ives said there's nothing random about the timing. 
Musk in recent years has become outspoken on politics. He often criticizes the Biden administration and Democrats' positions on issues including transgender rights and immigration. California voters have historically supported Democratic candidates, while Texas is considered a reliable Republican stronghold. Musk said SpaceX's main office would move to an existing facility in Boca Chica, Texas, while X would move to Austin. But the extent to which jobs or facilities in California will transfer to Texas was unclear. Well, that wraps up our final bulletin for the day. We'll see you again tomorrow with the latest happenings. Until then, I'm Sonia Mudanayaka. Good night.